awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. I was riding on a bus one day when I overheard a conversation. Hello, Reverend, how are you today? A young woman greeted her elderly pastor. I am very blessed. Thank you so much for asking, answered the aged gentleman. My curiosity was piqued. As the two discussed the mundane functioning of their small congregation, it became clear that God was an intimate part of their everyday lives. I began to reflect that blessings did not necessarily involve great gifts, but rather an ability to see the hand of God in daily life. David was a king, such a great king that forever after, the people of Israel compared all leaders to him. He was a shepherd boy taken away from his flock, and because of his fidelity to his calling, the image of the shepherd became synonymous with good leadership. He at times gave himself over to sin, yet he penned wonderful poetry that we cherish even today to sing praises to the Most High God. David never forgot the covenant that God made with his people. In his final words, David said, the spirit of the Lord speaks to me. His word is on my tongue. Like David, we are called to sing the glories of God's name openly to witness to God's gift to, to us. Let us pray. God of the covenant, thank you for touching my life with your gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'll finish it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's a very interesting morning for me, as usual. I never really know what we're going to do until later, even if I study, start studying the lesson two weeks beforehand, but, and I'll share why. And I trust some of you have read the, the lesson. I know that some people don't bother. But we are going to hear about a man by the name of Ezra today. And it's an interesting little book, 10 chapters. And for some reason, we are only going to supposed to study the last half of the seventh chapter. Just a handful of verses. So I have to, I spent a lot of time wondering why, because the first part of that chapter is very instrumental in setting the whole thing up. And I decided that that's what I would do. And finally, so we went back. The, the setup is, I will do some of the setup anyway. However, the reason that I'm flummoxed a little bit. I have received the book for the next quarter. And the authors or the editors didn't forget. Thank you. A little stage direction there. <laughs> I, I can hear that, but I can never tell if it's my hearing aids or this. But at any rate, the st stage directions can. At any rate, the uh, reason that the editors or publishers, writers, ignored the first half of the book in the first half of the chapter was they're going to do the whole thing starting the first of March the first Sunday in March second and third okay so a lot of my study had been redundant but it was good for me because I always need to review but the reason for the inserting this in here must be the fact that we must he the author or editor whichever wants us to know about Ezra. Now Ezra was a man in, the lesson's really simple, I can read what we have to read in about three minutes, okay? And I'm just going to share what, the reason that these words are in here is that Ezra has proven himself to be a master of the law. 
And he's done this in captivity in Babylon. Okay? Very different. When you think about captivity and slavery, you don't necessarily think about the people who are in slavery growing in their faith, especially in this way, learning about Israel going way back to the beginning of Jacob and back further yet. Wow. I feel like little Jimmy Dickens. Are any of country music fans? <laughs> they just stand away where I carry and shout into it. <laughs> At any rate, am I better? <laughs> Israel has had a habit from its in inception of being in a favor with God when it was established. Then they went over to, they begin to sin. And how do they do that? By breaking. God's law. And then, of course, with that, you get down to the bottom, disfavor or judgment. All right? You start getting punished. You start to realize, maybe I messed up. I'm sorry, God. And I come up here to repentance, and God hears us, and out of his mercy, he forgives us, the Israelites, and he's, they're back in favor. And they did this. I can go through scripture and find a dozen times where they did this. You think somebody would catch on. But our instance right now is they're in Babylon. They are prisoners of the Persians. Back in 606, the Assyrians were their enemies, and the, uh, that, that was following the Egyptians who had had them in uh, slavery. But the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. And finally, by the way, the Babylonians were the ones who actually destroyed, after the divided kingdom, the Babylonians were the ones who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem, and took most of the valuable citizens went to Babylon. Okay? Some of those poor folk were left out in the field, and then they could come and sort of, they took over. They made it hard for the rest of this story to take place after a while. But the point being that we now have a man who was raised, who lived most of his life in slavery, studying in the library of a man by the name of Nehemiah, who in, you know him as a cupbearer. He tasted the wine for the king. In case somebody wanted to poison the king, that was the way they got rid of kings back then. So he was a wine tester. And he had an important job. The king naturally cared a lot about him. And he also had a big library and made a lot of notes. And you'd remember, there's a book by the name of Nehemiah that follows the book of Ezra. But Ezra gets credit for writing that book using Nehemiah's notes. Ezra gets credit for writing First and Second Chronicles as well. So he's a pretty important guy. But the fact is, we're supposed to gather out of this lesson, I think, is that not only was he important to uh, us, I don't want to do about that, but not only was he important to us, but he was important to the king. All right? Now, remember that, you will remember that when they went into slavery, they were being judged by God. He promised them what was going to happen. If you go back to the book of Daniel, he promised them they were going to spend 70 years in captivity. All right, that's the book of Daniel. Now Daniel it became one of those captives. All right? In fact, back in 606 BC, the very first of three dispersions to uh, Babylon took place. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among the most, were, were among those that went because they were the most promising of the young and they were taken there. There were two other dispersions, and the last one was at 586, 536, hmm, every now and then those numbers get mixed up in my brain, <laughs> okay, that's the way it is, 70 years, uh, when the temple was finally destroyed in 586, right, 586 BC, because it was rebuilt in 516 BC, which is exactly 70 years. Most of us look at the 70 years of captivity. When I was studying this, I find it's more significant to me that the 
70 years of being without the temple was more important than the 70 years they spent away from their land. That book says that they spent that time there because during their 490 years that preceded their captivity, they disobeyed God's rule, one specific rule. The Sabbath year. Every year, every seventh year, was to be one where the fields would lay fallow. And we've studied that in, in Revelations a couple weeks ago, but this would have been a pretty hard thing to do. But there were, they were <laughs> conniving and scheming, pe scheming people could get through that. But the idea was that God would bless them enough in year six so that they had enough for seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so that they'd have seed to plant at, in the eighth year and wait for the harvest at the end of the eighth year. So God knew what he was doing, but they disobeyed that and they just kept it going. And just like we do, we work seven days a week. I've done that in my life. And you pay for that because God gave you that seventh one for rest. Okay, whether we're talking about the days of the week or whether we're talking about the years. Well, they ended up in slavery for 70 years because they broke that law. And their judgment, their, circle, their cycle was changed a little bit because they were, and I didn't, I don't know if I didn't just have time to do it right, to, to show you the, the new pattern. But their new pattern was really pretty simple. He said, okay, you're going to be in captivity and you're going to stay there for 70 years. Isaiah was one of his uh, prophets of God. And 200 years before the birth of the man by the name of Cyrus, a Persian, when you go to Isaiah 35, I believe, you'll find the story that he, God, is saying through Isaiah that Israel will be in captivity. Now, Isaiah had a tough job as a preacher. He was to tell them how they were going to suffer. And they were in the highest of times. They were wealthy and prosperous, and he's telling them, you're sitting here, you're going to pay for it, and they don't believe him. So he had a tough job. But his job included this. He included that you're going to be, have a savior. A Messiah, God's anointed. And his name is going to be Cyrus, and he's going to be a Persian. So in, in addition to trying to tell these very prosperous people that they're headed for a downslide, you're going to tell them that a foreigner they probably had they never heard of, hadn't been born yet, wouldn't be born for 200 years, was going to be their Messiah. Well, it happened. And in 536 B 538 BC, he took over, he conquered the Babylonians, which meant he inherited the Jewish population. When he inherited that population, he came with a mindset. I don't know if he read Isaiah, but he said, God told me, the God of Israel. Now, he's a pagan. To the rest of our knowledge, it never stopped being a pagan. But he said, the God of Israel was the one who made me a strong warrior. He gave me the power to do, have all the conquests I have. And by the way, the Persians actually, in the high point of their time, went from the Mediterranean Sea, the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea, to India. That's a bunch. And from above Syria down to below Egypt. So they had a big, they were a big deal until Alexander the Great came along and changed that. And that's the way history has changed. But while he, Cyrus, was in charge, he said, and that's uh, yeah, 538, in 536, two years later, he said to the Jews, your God has put it in my heart to build a house for him in Jerusalem. So he said, everybody who was brought up here who would like to go home not only did he allow them to go home, but he paid for their journey. And he made sure that they're his governors paid for the materials for the house. Okay? So he was definitely in favor. He knew God's favor, and he was doing what God wanted him to do, although still a pagan. You want to read what he says? Read the last guy, a couple of verses in the, the Chronicles, and he tells why he's doing what he's doing. 
or it's because God put him in the heart. By the way, and this is the first part of chapter 7, which I, you'll, you'll learn much more about in March, but out of 2 to 3 million people, Jews in Babylon, any idea how many people took his offer? Less than 50,000. Just under 50,000. And of those who took his offer, it was just over 43, 42,000. But then they had seven slaves that went with 7 million. 7,000 slaves, which brought them up to 49,000 people. And they had lots of donkeys, horses, camels, all supplied by the king. Okay? So he wanted the house built. He built the house. Now we're going to get to where we're supposed to be. Fifty years later, the house is built. Unfortunately, they had a building, but they didn't have any spirituality. And the people needed to be brought back to that. And now we're two kings, three kings later, or yeah, there were two insignificant kings between Cyrus and Artaxerxes the, Xerxes the first. And Artaxerxes the first, they didn't, no, they didn't call him the first because it hadn't any sub subsequent ones yet, so he was the first one though. At any rate, he came up, and this is where his um, feelings of Ezra comes in. First place, we hear in our text, Ezra is given, we get the genealogical qualifications for Ezra. And it's, this is Ezra 7, 1 to 6. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sarea, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ah. Uh, to be getting bored yet? You get down to 16 generations, and we get down to Phineas, who, the son of Phineas. Phineas, you may remember, he was made a priest, he, although he was in the line, he won God's favor by taking his spear and throwing it between an Israeli man and a Midianite woman named Cosby <coughs> because they were sinning against the Lord. And he speared them together. Okay? Sounds terrible. God said he, he did a good thing. He, there was a plague going on against Israel by God because of their sinning with the Midianites and the Moabites and the Amorites. And when he threw the spear, he got rid of the, the plague ended. Because finally someone from Israel obeyed God. Said, put a stop to it. Okay? So Phineas, that's why he's in here. He's a grandson of Aaron. The king, oh, this Israel came up from Bethlehem, from Babylon, excuse me. He was a teacher, well versed in the law of Moses. Law of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, right? Which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king had granted him everything that he'd asked for, and the hand of his Lord, his God, was on him. So that's one of the reasons he was chosen. By the way, in here, I yeah, did mention that he was the son of Hilkiah. When you go back to Josiah, one of the later kings of Israel, he came into power and he saw that the temple was in bad shape. So he started to repair the temple and it was, it was in bad shape because it wasn't being used. They didn't, they made religion, but they didn't have spirituality. So they get he has to refurbish the temple, and one of the priests said, hey, I found a book. I found the book of the law. And when Josiah, the young kid, read that, he tore his heart out, and he said, this isn't going to happen anymore. So at any rate, the law was found, and the law helped him establish, reestablish faith, okay, the religious life. So that was 622. We come over to Ezra. Chapter 7, verse 7 to 10. Now, I should tell you a little bit about what's happening right here. And that is that Ezra is in charge as a respected student of the law and a priest. He is assigned the job 
of taking another group of people, the second re return to ex from exile to Jerusalem, and his job is to provide the spirituality, to bring up the congregation to match the temple. And as part of his job, he's going to refurbish this temple, and I use the term refurbish. Cyrus sent all the things Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from them, the instruments of the temple. But there are some other things, I guess everything from curtains and all kinds of things that the temple needed to look better. You remodel your house? I don't know, maybe that's part of it. But the king, Artaxerxes, gave him a lot of money, a great deal of money. And gold in, in the form of gold, gold and silver, in addition to letters that said, hey, help these people out, get this done. But the real reason that Ezra was, went was to build up the spiritual life of the temple. Now at this time, there were some other people you'd know about. You'd know about a man by the name of Malachi, last book of the, last book of the Old Testament. He was there. He was their moral leader. As Ezra was their spiritual leader. Nehemiah was the governor, the political leader. And it's all started on the first visit with a man by the name of Zerubbabel, who took Nehemiah with him and of the 50,000 people that he had. And he was the builder of the temple. So everybody had a job. These, these people worked together. The whole thing was to put the temple together so that when the people came back from Babylon, they could have a godly nation. Well, we heard how many people wanted to go back. Why, why do you suppose that was? I probably guessed that in March. I hope you'll talk about that in March. But think about that. You lived for 70 years in a foreign country. Jeremiah under the word of God, told the people of Babylon, don't fight this, of uh, uh, Jerusalem, don't fight this. Just go with them. Ride it out. It's going to be just fine. You'll live there. They're not going to mistreat you. You can plant your gardens and eat your own food. Guess what? They prospered. Much like they prospered in the land of Goshen, in Egypt. But they prospered. So when they were given the choice of walking 880 miles back to Jerusalem, some of them took that as kind of tough. I would say 880 miles. Think about that real quick. From here to Key West, back up to here, and up to South Carolina. Oh. <laughs> okay? And a lot of them, I mean, the first ones had a lot of horses and camels and so forth. But a lot of them had to walk. And there were children involved. It actually took uh, four months, four full months. Ezra started his journey with less than 2,000 people. He started it on the first day of the first month. That's significant to me because when they left Egypt, God told them in the Exodus, today, it's the first day of your life. This is the first day of your calendar. Your calendar starts there. <clears throat> okay? So here, he does.